I'm Marie. Hi. And I'm Marie. And usually our video lessons are on poetry, analyzing poetry, and different types of poetry. But today, for Activism Week at Inspiration Banner at Summer Camp, we are going to be discussing the Harlem Renaissance. Okay, so what is the Harlem Renaissance? The Harlem Renaissance was a period of African-American cultural explosion from 1918 to the mid-1930s centered in Harlem, New York. It was spurred from the Great Migration to the North. So the Great Migration was a mass relocation of African-Americans from the South to the North. And what motivated them to go to the North was that in the South there was um, even after the, aboli the uh, abolishment of slavery, there was still a lot of segregation and injustice and racism in the South and Jim Crow laws that limited um, several opportunities for African Americans. So they were motivated to head to the North for opportunities and just a sense of freedom. However, when they got to the North, they weren't as welcome as they had hoped. Um, there was still some segregation. Um, and prejudice, but um, the migration of African Americans from all over the South to the North created a uh, created the Harlem Renaissance because it created a culture for African Americans to identify with um, fellow African Americans from different states and to just create an identity of shared experiences. And it was an influential movement that embraced African American literary, musical theatrical and visual arts. So now we are going to talk about the artists and the art they created during the Harlem Renaissance. Um, we were not able to cover every single person involved in this movement, but we're talking about some really important people um, and we encourage you to research more about this when we finish our presentation. So first, we're going to be talking about poetry and the poet and some poets. Um, these are three really big names: Claude McKay and James Wynne Johnson. Um, these are all three black men discuss um, as a black person. They have different writing styles and voices, but they share some sort of themes in their poetry. So the first poem I'm going to read, I too I to sing America. I am the daughter brother. They sent me to eat in the kitchen when company comes, but I laugh and eat well and grow strong. Tomorrow, I'll be at the table when company comes. Nobody will dare say to me, eat in the kitchen then. Besides, they'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. I, too, am America. So, in this poem, Nixon Hughes is talking about um, his discrimination he's faced as a black person in America, but he's encouraging himself and his readers to still stand up for themselves and grow strong um, because one day they will be accepted by society or to accept themselves for others. The next poem I read is birth of mad and hungry dogs, making a mock at our law. If you must die, oh, let nobly be die, so our precious may not be shed in vain. Then even the monsters we defy shall be constrained to honor us through dead. O oh, kinsmen, we must meet the common foe. Though far outnumbered, let us show us brave, and for the thousand blows deal one death blow. What the forest lies the open grave? Like men will face a murderous, cowardly pack, press the wall dying, but fighting back. In his own McKay, um, 
is talking about all the injustices black people face during their daily lives, but he's encouraging his readers to continue to fight for their lives and for the rights so that they themselves and the generation after them can have a better life. And he encourages his readers to fight until the death for, you know, his right. And the last one we're going to read today is you can listen to it, but here it is. Um, let every voice and sing. Let every voice and sing. For heaven, ring with the honey, celebrity, let our rejoicing rise high as the rising skies. But as loud as the rolling sea, sing a song of faith that the past has us. What the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day, search on to the truth. But in the days when hope unborn had died, yet with the feet of my very feet, come to the place for which our father sighed. Our way that with it is we have come to a path with blood slaughter. On the gloomy past, to the night stand. Or the white of our bright stars cast. God of our weary years, God of our seven tears, thou who hast passed us far on the way, at last by thy might, let us into the light. Serve the path we pray, lest our feet go straight from the places our God who met thee. Let us start with the one of the world we forget thee. Shadow may we forever stand true to our God, true to our native land. Now I'm gonna play a short clip of the song for you guys so you can listen. <laughs> Talking about the music of the Harlem Renaissance. So, the genre we're going to focus on today is jazz. Jazz is the type of is a genre of music that originates from blues, and blues is all about discussing struggles and hardships of Black life. So, um, during this time, jazz was performed at speakeasies to discuss the struggles of common Black life. Speakeasies were secret places where alcohol was sold during prohibition. And not only did Black people perform in these places because they weren't allowed to perform um, at more mainstream bars and um, performance centers, performance halls, but also they had the freedom to speak about the struggles of their life, often caused by their white counterparts. So we are here the holiday, Louis Armstrong and Duke Ellington, three humongous names, not only jazz, but music in general, not only during that time, but even now today. And three and three very popular songs. Again, to this day, three very influential songs. There's a lot of songs that sample any of these sounds. You've probably heard, you probably have heard at least a bit of each of these songs. So that's just to show you how impactful influential the Harlem Renaissance is. The first one we're going to do is sung by
Rest of the song and then look up the meaning of lyrics. The powerful stuff she's speaking about. It is Louis and this song is called What a Wonderful World. jazz some examples there's so much to learn about the music genre and all of these people and so many more songs that have written them but we just to get a little taste of this and so is mostly known the literature that came out of it so the poetry because there's, there's such important writings from this period. Here are two people that are very influential, Zora Neale Hurston and James Weldon Johnson. And Zora Neale Hurston wrote the book, Their Eyes Were Watching God. And this book is about a um, Irish woman. And it's just following her through throughout her life. And it was very, but it's a classic and it got so much praise from a lot of people but it also received some criticism from the um those in the Harlem renaissance movement because there are basically two sides one side of people who wanted all the artists during this movement to really focus on making black people look really good showcasing their intelligence and how meaning they were, meaningful they were to society, and just trying to make them, make others feel that they were equal. There's another side that felt that their duty was to just express Black life as it was, and show its beauty in all different forms. And Zora Neale Zora Hurston fell on that second side, so she was really about just giving an authentic um, story. And that's what she did in their eyes are watching, their eyes watching God. And James Walden, James Walden Johnson talked about his poem and um, the Black National Anthem. But he also wrote a book called The Autobiography of an Ex-Colored Man. Now, this book is about a Black man who passes as white in the South, and it also details his life. Um, it's, it's a very interesting book, also a very classic, also received praise and criticism. Um, so yes, that was something. Those are just two people, two books, very important and very influential. 
Okay, so now we're going to talk about the visual art um, during the Harlem Renaissance. And keep in mind before I go any further that a lot of these artists and performers we're going to talk about um, use their platform to really just highlight Black culture um, and as a form of activism. Okay, so the first artist we're going to talk about is Archibald John Motley Jr. Um, he was an American painter, um, best known for his depictions of the of Black social life and jazz culture. And he was also famous for his portraits, like the one uh, I have an image of. Um, it's called Portrait of My Grandmother. And he had an a special, a special fascination um, towards African-American skin tones and um, because it's so diverse, you know, we vary from light, um, lighter shades to darker shades. So he had a very uh, strong interest towards um, depicting the diversity of skin tones among, Af among African-Americans. Um, the next artist we're gonna talk about is Richard, I mean, Richmond Barth. Um, Richmond Barth was, um, uh, he started off as a painter, but at the suggestion of one of his teachers, um, they told him to just try sculpting and he actually um, turned out to have a gift for it. Um, he was one of the earliest modern artists to depict African Americans in his work. Next, we have Aaron Douglas. Douglas was an American painter um, and graphic artist, and he incorporated a lot of cubist forms, and he liked to use a lot of ge geometric shapes that was drawn from African art. So he used a lot of circles, diagonals, and wavy lines to really energize his illustrations. And through those techniques, he depicted the realities of Black struggle um, and future aspirations for social justice and, and equality. Lastly, we have James Van Der Zee. James Van Der Zee was an African-American photographer known for his portraits during the Harlem Renaissance. He liked to take photos of African-Americans just in their daily life to just celebrate Black culture. So as you can see in this photo, he took a photo of the Alpha Phi Alpha basketball team. Um, you know, it's just to celebrate Black culture and to just create a, a feeling of pride in the Black community. Okay, now performance during the Harlem Renaissance. Um, the first thing we're going to talk about is the Savoy Ballroom. The Savoy Ballroom was one of the first racially integrated public places in the country. This ballroom was for everyone. It didn't matter what color, what race, it didn't matter. All you need to know was how to dance. Um, this ballroom really fostered a lot of um, dance culture, social dance culture in this time including the Lindy Hop. And the Lindy Hop was a form of swing dance and partner dance. Um, it was considered a cultural phenomenon that broke through the race barrier because everyone was doing it. It didn't matter, like I said, what race you were. And it was just a really um, energetic swing dance that required a lot of movement. Next, the Federal Theater Project. The Federal Theater Project was funded by Congress, actually, uh, during the Reconstruction era to provide jobs for people in the uh, theater business. And actually under the Federal Theater Project was the Negro Repertory Company. So it was a part of the Federal Theater Project, but it was made up of African Americans to create their own form of theater. Um, and it was so historically significant. Um, they put on several different plays, including one of the famous ones, like in the picture, called Steve Door. And it was uh, a chance for Black actors to use theater as a voice for activism and to shed light on Black struggle. Um, and lastly, Langston Hughes' Mulatto. Uh, Mulatto was an interesting production because it actually started off as a poem written by Langston Hughes, and then they turned it into a screenplay, or just a uh, a play, a production. Um, Langston Hughes wrote Mulatto. It was about um, interracial children and the grim reality behind it because they faced a lot of disrespect um, and didn't have any recognition um, among the white or black community. 
So he went to shed light on that. Next perform for performance, I want to talk about a few famous um, actors and actresses of this time. So first we have Florence Mills. And Florence Mills was one of the first African-American uh, so-called female superstars during the Harlem Renaissance. Um, she started her career um, with her sisters, actually, and she was in a dancing and singing group that performed in theaters in Harlem. Um, then she made her debut on the hit musical Shuffle Along. It was an all-Black cast, and her star performance helped make Shuffle Along a catalyst of the Harlem Renaissance because it was one of the first successful all-Black Broadway shows. Um, she uh, also appeared in uh, several musicals, and she won so many awards and even toured in France and other European cities. Um, Next, we have Paul Robeson. So Paul Robeson was an actor, a singer, and a civil rights spokesperson. He was one of the most famous African-American actors. Um, he, his um, rise to fan, fandom was, um, no, rise to fame was actually very interesting. Um, he grew up in New Jersey. Uh, he was really focused on academics, but he was also an athlete. He graduated as valedictorian of his class, and then he went to Columbia University where he earned a law degree. So he was a lawyer, actually, but he ended up being unsatisfied with his career just because of the overt racism he had to face. And he actually started acting at a YMCA, and turns out he just had a big break, and he actually was on the chorus on the musical Shuffle Along as well. And his career just continued to take off, and he was in a lot of um, productions such as Eugene O'Neill's All God's Chillin' Got Wings. Um, next, we have Aussie Davis and Ruby Dee. So Aussie Davis and Ruby Dee was a dynamic duo and power couple of the Harlem Renaissance. Um, and their success tracks from, they started off in an African-American theater, then they went to Broadway, then they made their debut in Hollywood, starring in several movies, including Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing and Jungle Fever. Um, they both initially had, uh, you know, their separate careers as an actor and an actress in African-American theater, but their joint um, power as a couple began when they first met on Broadway's production, Jag, where they actually played romantic sweethearts, and then, <laughs> surely enough, they became sweethearts. And the couple were also, so they played in a lot of movies, but they were also civil rights activists um, trying to highlight Black freedom and struggle. Um, they were actually MCs at the March on Washington and delivered a eulogy at Malcolm X's funeral. So next, the impact. The impact of the Harlem Renaissance rejected racist stereotypes of the South. So during the Harlem Renaissance, it really changed the image that um, white Americans perceived of black Americans from, it went from just uneducated to um, educated and really modern and urban and their perception of just black Americans completely changed. Um, the Harlem Renaissance created a new pride for African-American culture and commitment to activism. Um, um, as we, in this period, as we began to see uh, more African-American faces in the art industry, um, it just created a sense of pride for all Blacks throughout the country. And it enabled them to have a platform to um, be activists. And lastly, it inspired and influenced future African-American artists. So art still carries the same um, styles that were created during the Harlem Renaissance. And it also pioneered Blacks into spotlight positions and um, as like famous artists, and it opened the door to allow more Blacks in the industry. And it also opened African-Americans' eyes um, that art can be used as a vehicle to voice oppression and to promote activism and to create change. And art is still used in that way today.
So thank you guys so much for watching and listening to our video. We uh, know that this activism week is really important and we want to highlight some very important black voices, historical black voices, and talk about their impact in the past and today. We want to encourage you guys to continue educating yourself on black issues, but also black history, um, even at conscious food. So thank you guys so much for watching. Really appreciate it. We hope you have a great Thank you. Hi, we are your IFA co-founders. I'm Ellie. And I'm Miriam. And thank you so much for watching our videos. You guys can learn more about our cause down below at our website, www.inspirationfinearts.org. And if you like this video, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. We couldn't be where we are without the support of you guys, so make sure to send in videos of the things that you've learned during classes and pictures of the art that you completed. Everything you send in will be featured on all our social media platforms. Thanks for supporting us, and until next time, go find your inspiration! inspiration.